Uh, uh, this is Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. This is the uh, fourth episode in our study of uh, the characters Adam and Eve. If you haven't seen the first three studies, they're available on my uh, YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, so it'd probably be very helpful if you went back and watched those first. Uh, but if you're watching us live now, uh, welcome to the, the show. Uh, I'm going to ask each of the panelists just to say hi to everybody, introduce themselves, and, and then we'll begin uh, discussing the topic. And we'll go from one side to the other, to, uh, starting with Brother Bill. Yeah, hello, I am the Panda Man Evangelist. My name, my name is really Bill, but you know that is my title because you know I, I like to evangelize and I'd, I'd like to see every single creature saved. Simple as that. All right, thank you, brother. And next is Brother Dean. Hey, Dean here. Um, my YouTube channel is Virtual at Twelve, and on that channel I can talk about the Bible and stuff like that, and other spiritual stuff. So, check me out, please. <coughs> All right, thank you, Brother Dean and uh, Sister Joanne. You got to run mute, Joanne. You you are muted, sister. Go ahead, start over. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, my name's Joanne G. Um, and that's the the same as my channel. Um, I'm only new um, with uploading videos. Um, however, I do intend continuing. Um, you know, uh, with God's will. Um, and I, I'm just uh, really wanting to bring um, glory to God and to uplift and encourage my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and also um, just to let people know the good news of Jesus Christ and, you know, um, that salvation is such a freedom um, and there is just so much love within Christ and I just want to share that. All right. Thank you, sister. Uh, next, we got our brother Sam. I think or, it looks like there's two things for Sam. Uh, are you up uh, uh, twice, Sam? Uh, yes, I am. Um, <laughs> the one is we'll give you double time that, today. <laughs> in case I got to move around and stuff, I mean, there's uh, uncle. Here's uncle me. Uh, Uncle Sam, I have uh, I also go by Thick Shades, along with uh, about twelve other channels, including Shop of Christ and and so on and so forth. But uh, basically, I'm here to uh, reprove uh, certain um, heresies and uh, heretics, and I'm here to uh, spank some reprobates and put them in order. Thank you. Right, you got to unmute now, Luke. Yeah, it's uh, again my my cursor is not working very well, so trying to unmute and mute is uh, sometimes sometimes that's the issue. Um, okay, let me just say to the world or whoever is watching this that, uh, about the panelists, uh, um, I'm, the way that I do these hangout shows is probably different than you've you've seen in many of the other hangouts. Uh, uh, everybody on this, uh, any of my panel's discussions are um, scrutinized before they're invited to participate in the panel. Uh, every person on the panel believes in these core doctrines of Christianity. Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, Salvation is a free gift we receive through faith alone in Christ alone. No religious works are required on our part. And uh, when we relieve, when we receive the gift of salvation, we have eternal security. We cannot lose it. Uh, and those uh, core doctrines unite us. And then uh, all the other subjects, uh, whether we're studying Adam and Eve or 
end times eschatology or Bible translations or anything else, we all agree that uh, we may not always agree on the other things, but we will continue to love each other and have cordial, respectful discussions on the other topics. Uh, so uh, that's who we are, and we're going to continue talking now about Adam and Eve. Uh, let's pick up where we left off last time. Uh, now that we have uh, Brother Dean back, we can get to uh, uh, some difficult questions again. He he, he always dares to ask us hard questions. <laughs> We're going to start at um, Genesis 4.1, and it says, uh, uh, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Okay. Uh, let's let's just leave it at that one verse and, and discuss that before we move on here. Uh, uh, now, if anybody wants to, whoever unmutes first, just start talking, and everybody else will. That's probably the best way, rather than me putting the pressure by calling someone's name. Yep, yep. I, I was supposed to pick up what we was, was talking about last week. You know, it says Adam knew Eve, his wife. So it's interesting. That, that Eve was not called his wife until he knew her. So the two became one, you know, in, in union through obviously, through you getting to know each other, you know, intercourse, then they became man and wife. So that, that was an interesting point we picked up on last week as well, and as obviously we're, we're continuing now. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's an important point for me anyway. Wife, uh, I okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. What I find interesting about this is um, it brings me back to my question um, from part one, where I suggested that um, Adam and Eve weren't the first humans. You, know, it was telling us here that Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived from Burkean. Why would it not tell us that he they um, knew each other and then? Conceived all these different people as well. That King, that was after Cain, and who Cain was afraid of, and stuff like that. Uh, okay, uh, that's a good question. He didn't waste any time, did he? Did he uh, trying to stir things up, huh? <laughs> uh, well, first, l let me relate. To, I was going to ask a follow-up question based upon what Bill said, and then we'll get into Dean's question. <clears throat> that is, uh, when it says uh, Adam knew Eve, uh, I've heard people speculate that Adam and Eve were having uh, sexual relations uh, before the fall. Uh, I, I don't see any indication in the scriptures where we could conclude that. It... it uh, they're, if, if, if someone wants to believe that, they're interjecting it, they're inserting it, or it's eisegesis. It's not in the scriptures, they have to put it in there. Uh, so I would conclude that this is the first time that they've had sexual relations. Uh, and then when we get to the follow-up question of Dean, uh, well, uh, you're, they do mention all the other people uh, after, after uh, Cain, I mean Abel, um, then... Uh, Cain and Abel, there is a whole list of genealogies. In fact, to me, the most boring part of all the scriptures is reading all the genealogies. So there's a very thorough listing of all these other uh, begots uh, that to, to come. But let me ask anybody else if they want to uh, respond to that verse and answer Dean's question. We had to uh, just answer that question, as you said, because we have obviously uh, Cain recorded. And Abel, and then also Seth later on, because Seth obviously took the place of Abel because he, he was murdered. But within the genealogy, the, the basic genealogy here we see in Genesis, Genesis four and five as well. It, it's it's shown you the important figures within that genealogy because you know they, 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 there's a good chance, although it isn't stated, they had other children, you know, sons, daughters, etc. But because these three are significant, you know, I, I think that's why only these three are mentioned. Because obviously, you know, Cain was the first. Cain killed Abel, who was the second. Seth replaced 
obviously able, and then we can follow Seth's, uh, you know, genealogy, you know, through to know us. So I think it's just naming them three specifically because they are significant, and, and you see throughout, you know, throughout the whole Old Testament, and even the New, how they're all, you know, intrinsically linked. So I think that's that's the reason only those three are mentioned. But I do, you know, per adventure that that, that, that Adam and Eve did have a lot more children. You know, lived all eight hundred, nine hundred years. They they was pretty busy, I should imagine. Yeah, uh, I think a kind of a contemporary example, uh, brother Dean, of uh, uh, to make the case what B Bill was saying is that. Uh, we have just begun this uh, approach to studying the scriptures called character studies. In the past, I've always done topical studies, where you, we, we pick a topic, a theological topic or question, and study it out. But now we're taking individuals. And uh, as we go through this, we're going to choose which individuals whether we think are significant enough to study. Uh, obviously, Adam and Eve, and we're going to go in kind of chronological order. So the first, of course, is Adam and Eve. Uh, however, as we go along, we're going to see a lot of names of people where we're going to agree, well, there's no reason to discuss them. There's not enough information. They're not interesting enough. They're not significant enough, as Brother Bill said. So just as we would choose to study the most significant people, uh, the scriptures also would only list the more significant people or a genealogy to prove a point. Some of the genealogies are there in uh, the gospel accounts. The genealogies are there for a specific reason to show a particular uh, gene genealogical line uh, to show that Jesus has this uh, ancestral heritage. Um, okay, uh, anybody else want to comment on that verse b before we move on? I, I just want to say that uh, uh, where it says um, have gotten a man from the Lord uh, kind of tells you exactly you know from the beginning uh, what man is uh, it, it's like God is defining what man is here and that is uh, um, a creation um, um, of course created in the image of God and also that um, it says from the Lord and you know meaning is from God obviously and that um, in this uh, you know having a kid is uh, a blessing you know yeah okay yeah, hi. <laughs> um, if I could just put my two cents worth in, um, if I may. Um, look, I, I totally, I, I totally agree um, with everything that's been said so far from Paul. And um, but I, I just find it really interesting that um, that all of a sudden, you know, um, Adam and Eve. Uh, first come together, um, and then we have, following that, obviously, the firstborn, um, you know, who ends up being the exact opposite of our firstborn, or God's firstborn, I should say, Jesus. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, um, the other point I just want to make is that... Um, uh, the male child traditionally being a firstborn um, was especially favoured um, and the male was there uh, basically uh, to help the family um, traditionally you know um, and his fa uh, you know uh, and so therefore Cain's family would also be required in the future to uh, look after Adam and Eve in their old age. So you can imagine, even though they were just kicked out of the garden for their transgressions, and rightfully so, um, the joy and the um, of having this firstborn, and maybe thinking that 
the future isn't going to be so bad, but their transgressions followed them into um, Cain eventually. You know, um, and it's just funny that, you know, we even, well, it's not funny, um, we see, uh, uh, for example, in China, you know, today, um, even that how important the male child is, that it, but they've gone to the extreme of favouring males against females and, you know, and unfortunately they've done some horrific things and they're, you know, like baby girls are killed and or given away or abandoned um, and, and they have the issues then of being over male populated um, and that's to an extreme but I just wanted just to point that out, the importance of what a male, and this is the first male after Adam, their first born child and how they would be, you know, holding your baby for your first time and not, you know, not realising the joy in that and then coming to the realisation later that you've, you know, your transgressions have followed you through, um, you know, out of paradise. Sorry, I don't know if that's made sense to anyone, but I just sort of thought I'd bring that in. Yeah, you know, also I would like to add that uh, this is what Eve is saying, you know, I have gotten a man from from the Lord, you know. It's not like God is saying that, oh, I'm giving you and such and such, and this is what Eve is saying. <laughs> so whether, uh, whether what she says is true or not, uh, you know, she is uh, considering at least that this baby is a blessing, so to say. And there are people out there, and some wild, wild people who believe in Gnostic uh, Calvinism and, and things like that. And they believe that Eve had some kind of, you know, uh, sexual uh, thing going on with uh, with the serpent in the garden, you know, and that it could also. <laughs> I mean, if if we are we if we were to take that as true, then you know we can see here that how Eve is saying that she might have got gotten confused as uh, the serpent as the Lord, so to say. Uh, so whatever it is, whichever uh, it is, uh, it is Eve that's saying this, All right? Not not God. I think that the uh, point uh, Joanne brought up about the male-female stature uh, that uh, we saw was established when we, we discussed this twice already in the study and, and that uh, this, the female would be the helper and uh, the I find it interesting that all the in the genealogies only the males names are mentioned and when we're considering how many children they had, it makes me wonder how many female children they had among all these males that are listed. So we have Cain and Abel and Seth listed so far, but perhaps there were females that were uh, born during that same time, but they weren't listed because that's not the way they list the genealogy. So there could have been several more that we're not even aware of. Yeah, it's, it's just want to make one quick point, Ambassador. Right? Is in, in we get a hint of things in in John's Gospel, chapter twenty one, twenty five, and, and it says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, that which if they should be written, every one, I suppose, even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So they got a hint there. If if I was to divulge every single you know child that was born by every single you know person in the Bible, you know we'd we'd need about you know four thousand books in the Bible. But I think you know it it, it shows us that that for certain things that are significant have been placed in the Bible, and, and things that not saying that the people are not significant in God's eyes, but you know insignificant. Writings were not, you know, would not have been written. You know, it wouldn't have said, and, and and Eve had this daughter, that daughter, that, and, and run off about forty-five daughters and another twenty sons. You know, that that wouldn't have been, you know, needful. And I think we get the hint there from John. You know, if if, if it was so, we would would have literally thousands of books. Hmm. 
I, I would second that. That uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up. To me, uh, it this idea that uh, only a, a small part of what uh, uh, what we would like to know, what would be helpful to us to know, but only a small part of that is actually available in the scriptures. And this verse here points out that there's much more that could be written, but they didn't write it down. Uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons you know we look forward to eternity. We're going to be forever and ever and ever learning. And you know we're all here voluntarily. Um, nobody was uh, like somehow compelled or forced to join this panel. We did it because this is what we want to do. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit in us has uh, transformed us so that our desire is the scriptures and, and fellowship with, among believers and, and the talking about Jesus. This is what we want to do. Uh, we, we love to learn more and more about the scriptures. And in eternity, we're going to learn a lot more. And it will fill in these, a lot of these gaps, I think. But to me, this is one of the principles of Bible study itself is realizing that there's a lot of things that are uh, between the lines that are we don't know, it's just not written. Um, shall we go on to another verse, or anybody else want to elaborate further on, on, on anything said so far? Okay, uh, let's go. To, oh, by the way, you, you'll notice in the notes I put forth here on study of Adam and Eve, I've only listed the verses that uh, actually have the name Adam and Eve in it. Uh, because we want to stay focused on Adam and Eve in this study. Uh, but there's other car characters, of course. We had the serpent introduced, and we got sidetracked talking a little bit about the serpent. Uh, and now we got some of the characters introduced here. We've got Cain, and then in Genesis 4.25. Uh, did I read this yet, or did we? Uh, I don't think I did. Okay, in Genesis 4.25 says, in Adam knew his wife again, uh, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God said she, uh, for God said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Now we could go look up all the verses that pertain to Cain and Abel and what, ha what happened, and if anybody wants to post those, we can discuss them. Uh, or we can discuss just the, the concept of what happened. Uh, but the first thing I would ask is, it says, and Adam knew his wife again. Now, because he knew her again, are we to believe that he only knew her uh, the two times that it's mentioned? Uh, or three times, apparently, because there's Cain and Abel that uh, uh, was slain, and now we have Seth, so there's three times that we know. Are we going to think that what he knew his wife only those three times, just because it says, and Adam knew his wife again? Shouldn't it say, and Adam knew his wife again, but he'd all, but he'd already, they've already had sexual relations, you know, many, many times oh, uh, in this time span, uh, so that, so that uh, Dean could be satisfied and say, well, Hey, uh, they've they've told me enough there. I don't need to misunderstand that they've only had sex three times now. Uh, so, and she bare a son and called his name Seth, and she said she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. We I guess we we must talk about Cain and Abel and what happened there. So first, let's focus on this verse here, and then we'll move on to Cain and Abel. Go ahead. Yeah, briefly, I'd just like to say, yeah, I, I think it's where, where it says he knew his wife again isn't literally that that's the only third time that he's had relationships with, him, with his wife, but it is because it's significant, you know, that they knew him again and a significant child was brought forth, i.e. Seth. So, that, you know, that's what I think about that. And also, I think that when it's written as new, I think it's more than having any, you know, sexual relationship, I think, you know. And 
I, I think most of us, being adults now, know that you know there there are quite a difference between mere you know physical relationship and you know knowing that person you know while you have that relationship. So I think uh, when it's written as new, I think it's, it marks certain significance other than just you know. Um, what you know would normally happen in, in marriage, so it, it, I think it plays both. It, it carries certain significance at the same time that uh, you know, just like what Brother Bill was saying, you know, it's it also means it doesn't only mean that uh, you know they only had three times relationship. Yeah. Another question that we should ask uh, in, uh, in these verses here is over what period of time did these couple of verses take place? Um, do you th think that they, they happened within a matter of you know weeks or months or or, or could have been uh, you know decades? Uh, uh, we know that Adam and Eve lived an awful long time. Uh, so uh, if if this uh, what we've read so far uh, happened over years, uh, many years. Obviously, there's a jump ahead because uh, it says that Cain, who, who Abel, who Cain slew. So obviously, this is referencing many years ahead because Cain and Abel were grown men. So you can see how there's a leap in time, and some people would think that well, this is just a matter of like days or weeks or months, but we're talking about decades probably, from one verse to the next. Um, all right, so if you want to say something about that, otherwise we'll move on and uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, exactly the significance of, of uh, Cain and Abel, what happened there and uh, their, their sacrifices. Um, can I jump in? Sorry, <laughs> again. Yeah, um, I, I was just wondering also, in, uh, in that verse, um, has anyone also noticed um, that it's the first time that uh, Adam is uh, mentioned in this chapter? Um, you, know, you know, there's no question uh, that the murder of Abel, um, you know, uh, and the apostasy of Cain, um, he were uh, a very great grief to uh, Adam and Eve, um, and even more because of their own wickedness. Um, did you know? Uh, did you know? Like they know that the correct. Um, sorry, um, wickedness. Basically, uh, they've realised. What's happened, and um, also, you know, the, um, their backsliding, you know, did reprove them uh, in this case, you know, and uh, also their, uh, you know, the folly uh, had given sin and death entrance into the world. Uh, I, I couldn't understand what you said because of uh, static on my computer here, so I, I'll have to have someone else reply to you, what you, whatever you said, sister. It was all, I only heard every other word, sorry. Uh, anybody, yeah, go yeah, ahead, Bill. Well, yeah, yeah, I think she was making the point, what, what we're, we're all making, that, that you know not everything is mentioned because both Adam and Eve would have been grieved over, you know, you know Abel's murder, yet... Yeah, Adam isn't mentioned, you know, in, in that chapter. It doesn't mention that Adam was grieved and this, that, and everything else. But it is mentioned in significant portions, you know, that that that, that certain children are, are mentioned. You know, and I think that, that that Joanne was just backing it up, saying that you know that you can't write absolutely everything because we would literally have a Bible that is about forty foot tall. You know, that it was to go into all the emotional depths of you know, you know of grief and everything else that that. that you know, they sustained. I think that was the gist that John was getting at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a valid point. Thank you both. Uh, I, but I want to ask Dean if he's if he is uh, uh, the the answers that we're attempting to give you, brother, in terms of 
not everything is written and a lot of time is passing in these short few verses. Is that uh, helpful to you at all in your question? Yeah, but stay on. All right, good. Uh, if someone wants to post the verses about uh, Cain and Abel, I didn't put them up on my notes here. We can read it exactly, but I'm going to su summarize what I think happened with uh, uh, Cain and Abel. It says that uh, uh, Cain and Abel made a, uh, Cain made a, a sacrifice to, to God. Uh, with this, uh, he brought in the uh, what he had produced from being a farmer. Uh, so he he worked real hard and grew a crop and brought a crop before God as a sacrifice to God, and God was not happy with it. Uh, and a lot of people think that's quite rude. Why would God be so rude? I mean, look what Cain did. He tried it so hard, and and it, uh, uh, he rejected this gift or sacrifice that that uh, Cain was offering him, and. Uh, of course, Cain's feelings were hurt, I'm sure. But then when we come to Abel, you know, uh, he offered him one of his flock, the best of his flock and the fat thereof, which means that he killed it and, and it uh, offered this life. Uh, and, and God was pleased. And then Cain was jealous because God was pleased with Abel's sacrifice or gift, but rejected his own. So uh, that's why, through jealousy, he killed his brother. Uh, but to me, the, the significance of, of this is another example. It's like the covering up with the fig leaves in the garden was not uh, satisfactory. And they could not solve the problem of their nakedness through their own labor and efforts to try to fix the problem. They needed, God had to provide the covering for them and it had to be a bloody covering and there had to be death involved. So he killed an animal and gave them animal skins to cover them. And in the same case, God was not willing to accept the sacrifice of the labor of Cain's hands because Cain could boast of all the work that he had done uh, and uh, to please God. And we all know that not only today, but in times past, uh, it's not it's not our works that please God. It's our it's our faith. So God accepted the sacrifice of Abel because it was a blood sacrifice, and that's a prophecy about the future or a picture of the future that only a blood sacrifice will satisfy God, and uh, that that's what uh, the, the 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 prophets in the past look forward to. And that's what we believers today look back to, is this sacrifice on the cross of Jesus. Go ahead if anybody wants to th comment whether you think I'm right or wrong about that. Yeah, I'll just want to second that, spot on. Absolutely spot on. And, and we have that picture, which is a wonderment in itself, all the way from Genesis, all the way to Christ, that, that, that our own efforts and our own works to try and please God, you know, they will not avail. It will not avail at all, and it is significant that that obviously Abel didn't have to work for anything. You know, it's obviously the sh you, you know his sacrifice was eating the grass. His sacrifice done everything, and and all Abel's job was to do was to offer up, you know, that sacrifice, that blood sacrifice to Christ. And obviously Cain, he tilled the ground, he worked, he watered, he obviously watered the plants and done everything else, you know, and then laid on his, you know, his sacrifice on the altar and burnt up. But again, like I said, he had to work for it. So th there's an element of, as you rightly said, you know, oh, look what I've done. Surely I'm going to please God now. I've put all this effort in. Aren't I good? But no, in God's eyes, no, that was not acceptable. You know, what's acceptable is it was, was that, that blood sacrifice, which is a picture of the perfect blood sacrifice, which was to come in Christ Jesus. So I 100% agree with that. It's, uh, it's like the verse uh, in Matthew where they say, Lord, Lord, look at all the mighty works we've done in your name. Uh, they, you know, it, it, it continued. I mean, people continued trying to uh, 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 reconcile with God. 
by showing all the works they've done and, and that they've earned it and deserve it. And even today, it's the biggest problem in the world is, is people thinking that they can somehow get reconciled with God through their own works. Uh, so we see it with uh, Cain. Uh, we, we, we see it with the, the man boasting to Jesus about, look at all the mighty works I did in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Because instead of putting his faith in what Jesus did and who Jesus is, uh, uh, he was putting his faith in his own performance. All right, shall we move on to the next verse then? Uh, Genesis 5.3 says, And Adam lived a hundred and thirty years and begat a son in his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. Okay. Well, that, that kind of makes the point that I was saying earlier that uh, a lot of times just between one verse and the next verse, you know, a hundred years could have passed. And, and uh, in this case, it tells us, hey, 130 years have passed now. <laughs> then he had Seth. So um, uh, there, there, there could have been many other children and children having children and grandchildren. How many generations of people, populations of people could come in 130 years? Uh, so I, I think this is a clue to uh, this other population of people that Cain went with uh, to get back to Dean's question. Yeah, what, what's significant as well, if we were to continue reading the next, obviously from verses 1 to 5, you know, it, it clearly tells us that, you know, that, that, that they begat, you know, other sons and daughters. You know, so it might be worth... You know, if you want to read from from one down to five, Luke. But you probably have to unmute yourself to do so. Okay, I, I don't have those verses in front of me now. Do you have them handy? Yeah, yeah, I can read them. Is that okay then? I'll... Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. So from chapter 5, Genesis, verses 1 to 5, and it goes, This is the book of the generation of Adam, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in that day where they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years. And he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. So you can clearly say, you know, in, in verse 4, it says that he, he, you know, he begat sons and daughters. So as we say, he lived, he lived 930 years. That's a lot of time to... To, to, to mass produce human beings, you know, excuse the, you know, the, the language. What I find interesting out there is, um, in verse 2 it says, Me and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Do you notice that I didn't mention the word Eve? And he said there, as in as in 2. Yeah, in, in that case, Adam is taken to mean mankind. The word Adam also is understood as mankind. So put put that in there in, in the place of Adam is, is the way that uh, many scholars understand the word Adam to have several different meanings. Okay. Uh, all right, well, Bill jumped ahead a couple of verses, uh, but let's do that all at once here. Uh, the important thing here, I think, is that not only to understand that 
all these years passed, and they had a lot of children, and the ch their children had children, and a large, uh, substantial population was beginning to grow. Uh, but uh, of course, I take you know the, I take scriptures literally, uh, unless unless uh, I, I'm pretty much forced to take it allegorically, uh, and, and or symbolically. And when it comes to something like the ages of these people, some people would challenge that and say, well, you really think that they live to be 900 years old? And uh, I say, yes, I do. Does anybody here think that uh, these uh, ages are, are incorrect or how could they have lived so long? Yeah, um, just uh, my, uh, you know, like my belief, um, you know, I, I, I'm very literal um, and I, I do believe uh, in the accuracy of what the Word of God says and, um, yeah, so I, I believe that Adam really did live um, you know, 930 years and then he died. Um, but for people that don't see that, maybe if you see what the condition of the world was like um, coming back then, it was untainted, we don't have pollution, we don't have um, a whole lot of, you know, we, we, you know, the trees are there, we've got, you know, um, just everything is just so perfect. You know, nobody's gone in and tainted the land for a start. You know, the atmosphere, we haven't polluted that. So um, I, don't, I don't see that it's not possible. And you're looking at someone that was created the, um, from, from God um, in, uh, in total perfection. Why wouldn't he live that long, considering everything put together? You know, the, the condition of the world, the... Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you, uh, Brother Bill. Uh, yes, the gene pool. Um, exactly. It's um, everything is perfect. God's created Adam, um, you know, directly himself. He is the first man in all perfection. Why... Why would God then lie and say, well, then, you know, this is how long he's lived when he did it. I mean, this is his perfection. Yeah, adding to that a little bit, you know, I, um, you know, there were environment a whole lot better than now. There are uh, more pressure and there are more oxygen during that time. So it's like being in the hydraulic chamber 24 7. So, <laughs> you know, obviously you're going to get, even if you get hurt, you're going to get cured uh, quite quickly. You know, hardly you won't get much illness. You run you run a few miles and you won't get tired. Uh, so we're talking about quite a, a different environment. And, um, and also like a lot of um, evolution is positive uh, and, and appeal to this uh, some sort of dating method and, and many different, there are many different types of dating methods but uh, one thing they lack is that they automatically assume that the environment then was uh, was the same as now. So without that uh, that sort of standard, without the without knowing the beginning condition, and to assume um, you know, how uh, you know, it was the same as now, and well, obviously that sort of dating method uh, will not be correct. But besides that, um, yes, you know, as Brother Bill and uh, Sister Joanne was uh, were talking about. The environment at the time was near perfect, including the gene pool, including Adam and Eve, um, and also how 
the condition, because of the condition, because of that sort of condition, there were abundance of uh, uh, food supply, and despite the fact that you know man had to uh, till the ground and sweat a little bit, uh, they had plenty of food, and, and, and as I said, the environment at the time was just near perfect to the point that anything and everything would grow well, including plant lives, animals, and everything would be thriving. It's even, even worth noting that, that it, didn't, it didn't actually even rain for the days of Noah. So that's significant in as much as there must have been, if you're logically speaking, a canopy between obviously what we see as, as the sky now, the outer atmosphere, and, and the inner atmosphere, So which obviously held water. And that would prevent you know, dangerous UV rays, perhaps. And, and yeah, so right. Then, yeah, that's yeah. That's one of the parts as well. And, you know, yeah. interesting because, you know, after Noah got off the boat, uh, Ark, you know, he sees this rainbow, you know. So when you kind of think about it, it's, it's significant, but at the same time, we got to ask ourselves why that rainbow is so significant at that moment of time, you know, meaning, you know, like maybe they don't want that sort of significant rainbow before that time. So we can assume this uh, canop canopy theory and that, you know, the whole earth, including the uh, extremities, uh, the poles, the whole earth was quite in a, a very near perfect condition or tropical condition, so to say. Uh, but it won't be, it wouldn't have been as extreme as now. Yeah, I think that uh, you guys have brought up um, uh, in kind of in a general in general way uh, the the main things that uh, uh, we use in apologetics to explain these problems. Uh, how can people live to such a long age? Uh, long age old age. Uh, so we know that we, we believe that the earth was different at that time and we believe that man was different at that time. And those two factors contributed to this longevity. Uh, now a, a lot more could, that could be said about what the earth's environment was like and what uh, uh, the, the gene pool and all that. Uh, you, know, you could probably do lengthy studies just on that alone. But for now, let's just say that these are the main reasons we think that man lived much longer back then. But so what happened so that man would, uh, his lifespan would gradually get shorter and shorter? And, and in fact, that gets us to this question. We finally reached the point the uh, promise was, was seen. Um, it said, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Now, some people might think that there's a contradiction in the scriptures because it says Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. Uh, whereas God said, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die that day. Well, we didn't see them die that day. We saw Adam die 930 years later. There's no record of Eve even dying, so maybe she's still alive if, if we're going to take the approach on Dean. Maybe, maybe we have to assume that Eve's still alive because they didn't write down that she died. Say, no, there's some things that are not written down that we just have to assume, you know? Uh, there's populations of people that are they're living that are not written down. We just have to assume that the population grew during those hundreds of years. Uh, so Cain had a population of people to move to. But here's the question. Uh, how can we reconcile the statement that God said, you're going to die that very day, you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet Adam didn't die until... 930 years later. Well, yeah, I'd just like to just briefly say, 
I think you know the context that that, that that God was portraying there was spiritual death as opposed to physical. Well, those physical death did occur because of the change of the environment, as we just said, and because uh, the, the whole environment was changed, and there was probably even uh, physical, metabolical, you know, changes within mankind as well. But yeah, I, I believe this evidence was that in the day that you eat, thereof you shall die. Now God's gonna, not going to lie, so he must be talking, this is logically concluding, that, that he must be talking about spiritual death, which is the real big problem that, that, that faces mankind today. It, it's a spiritual issue. You know, we're all going to die physically, but you know, not all of us are going you know, to spiritually die. We're not going to taste that second death if we know Christ. Yeah, we, we discussed earlier in this study, uh, probably episode one, the fact that man was made in God's image, and God is triune, and therefore man is triune. Oh, I am one man, yet I, there's three, three Lukes. There's the mind of Luke, or soul. There's, there's the, the body of Luke, and then there's the spirit of Luke. Now, be, be, before I was uh, believed in Jesus, I was walking around like a, a dead man. You know, uh, uh, my, I was spiritually dead according to the scriptures. We, we, we believe that Adam and Eve died that day spiritually. They're spiritual. I, I think it was the, the, their spirit and God's spirit when he breathed into them was connected. He had this spiritual connection. The Holy Spirit was in them. And then when they died, that Holy Spirit left, and their spirit was left like a stub with, with no life to it, a spiritual death. And they had no connection to God. And ever since then, man has been walking around. We inherited it. It's like a genetic defect. It's a disease that we passed on to our children. And, and uh, uh, until December of 1986, I was walking around, you know, Luke's body, Luke's soul, but a dead spirit. And then when I put my faith in Jesus, the scripture says I was quickened. I was brought to life. Now, I know that I was already breathing and my heart was pumping. So what does it mean? I was quickened. It was spiritually, my spirit was brought to life. My spirit was joined with the Holy Spirit who lived in me now. Now I'm spiritually alive and uh, born again spiritually from above and, and, and now I'm a child of God because I'm united with God through the Holy Spirit and, and uh, born again as a child of God. So I think what happened that day was they died spiritually. We all have an opportunity to get born again spiritually. Everyone on the panel, we've all chosen to do that through our free will Everybody watching right now has the, the opportunity to do that by putting their faith completely in Jesus. and your, your spirit will be brought to life. You'll be born again as a child of God. Uh, so, uh, but if you haven't done that yet, then you're walking around spiritually dead. Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> okay, unless someone wants to expound on that any further, uh, I think we've reached the point to understand now that uh, Adam and Eve in the uh, in the in the scriptures, uh, the 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 Old Testament, which is called the Law and the Prophets, uh, they there's no more reference to them. If you do a, a word search, you won't find their names again until we get to the New Testament. So we'll go into that next. But for now, we know that uh, okay, they they died spiritually when they fell. And, and then it took many, many years, and then they died physically. 
my question is, there's nothing in the scriptures that I know of that answers this question. A lot of people believe that Adam and Eve uh, are in heaven. Is there anything that we can go on that might tell us more about what happened with Adam and Eve and their faith and, and their salvation after that point? Uh, we know they fell. Do we know anything about their uh, regeneration? I, I, obviously, it doesn't categorically say, but it does hint at it when, when because obviously, when Christ was crucified and he was buried. He descended into the belly of the earth, as we know. And it says that, you know, Peter's epistles say it, that he preached. So he went to the belly of the earth and he preached. But obviously all the people that, that died before Christ had a chance to be saved. This is what I believe. So I'm assuming Adam and Eve were, were, were amongst them, Abraham, you know, David, and, 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 and all the, you know, the saints were amongst them. So I believe that Christ did descend literally into hell or Abraham's bosom, however you want to, you know, you know, explain it. And he preached to the, the, these people. And I believe personally, you know, once they had full revelation, because especially Adam and Eve, who knew God personally in the garden from the beginning, were, were best pleased to see, you know, the Son of God or God manifest in the flesh came down to them where they were and preached the good news. And I believe they got saved. That's what I personally believe. It doesn't say categorically, but it does hint at it and it does insinuate it, I believe, in Peter's epistles. Does anybody want to uh, give us any uh, teach us on this or, or speculate on it? Okay. Uh, the only thing I would say is that uh, I think that uh, there's a. Uh, I would tend to say that uh, Abel was saved uh, because he he didn't put his faith in his performance, his his works. He put his faith in God. He just provided a blood sacrifice. Somehow he knew, and if he knew it, then uh, I'm, I suspect that you know Adam and Eve knew it too. And probably Cain knew it, but wouldn't didn't want to do it. He wanted to uh, satisfy God through his own ego, his own works. Uh, but I think Seth understood that he needed to put his faith in God and trust that uh, this uh, he would accept this blood sacrifice. And, and uh, if that's the case, then uh, maybe Adam and Eve understood that too. And uh, other than that, I don't really have any reason to say one way or the other whether they are uh, in heaven or not. Okay, let's move on to the New Testament. Uh, comments on Adam and Eve. Uh, first one I found is Romans 5.14. It says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. All right. Does anybody want to start talking about that verse? Uh, see, this is this is a verse I'd like to see in a, other translations. Actually, uh, let me see if I can find it and look, compare it. Or if any, Sam probably has. He's putting it up on the screen. Uh, could you show us that that verse in a you know a, a modern English translation, Sam? I think Sam's briefly popped out. I'm going to see if I can screen share it, okay? Okay. Um, 
um, let's get this right screen share and tie screen I don't know if this will work but we, we can try I don't know if you can see that yeah oops no 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 I thought I had to do the screen oh. sharing. What about now? Is it there now? I have to do the screen sharing, don't I? No, I think I think I can. So if I do that again, if I go there, entire screen, okay. there, and then... Okay, nothing's then, showing up. What about now? Oh, okay. I yeah, see right. that now. Can you see it now? It's just not a very large reading. Yeah, but it's too short, too small to read. Um, Let me just look up on, in my uh, thing here. Uh, okay. Okay. Let's go. It's, it's uh, Romans five fourteen. I'm gonna look it up on this uh, Bible well, Hub. The English Standard Version says, "Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sin was not like the transgression of Adam. He was a type of the one he was to come." Okay. I think the problem right. is we need to we need to probably read verses fourteen and fifteen to get some context, perhaps. Okay. I'm gonna read uh, I'm gonna read fourteen and fifteen in the NIV, uh, that that evil satanic version that you know that pe people say we shouldn't study. Uh, here it is. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. The gift is not like the trespass, for if the, the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Okay, let's just start off uh, from, the, from the beginning. It says, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Now, I, what kind of death do you think that's talking about? Well, yeah, we can see it's talking about spiritual death, really, in as much as that that, that, that Christ gives us spiritual life. Now, when Christ came and gave us life eternal, he didn't give us physical life mortal in this fallen body eternal, did he? It's a spiritual life with a new body eternal. So, you know, Christ's assumption, you know, that the, the same sort of death occurred. It was a spiritual death that occurred. And it's a spiritual birth that's going to occur again in the second Adam. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Uh, and, and then it says, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. Uh, I mean, I know people that hey, define sin. They say this is the definition of sin: you've break, broken a commandment, you've broken the law. They say that's the definition of sin. But here it says sin by breaking a command as Adam did. Exactly. Well, the, the, How could uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the real clock said sin, you know, is although the commands are important, you know, in the old testament and, and significant, sin means basically to miss the mark. You've got to be absolutely hundred percent perfect. So there's no <laughs> no one can get there, can they? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm reading it in the NLT, 
uh, it's a paraphrase, says, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. So, uh, this is talking about um, spiritual death. I mean, why would it, uh, even right now, we still have physical death with us, don't we? Physical death is not cured, is it? As far as I know, I <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I have friends, you know, on a regular basis that you know are passing away, and that they have physical death. And uh, you know, I think that it's safe to say, unless we get the rapture, resurrection, uh, pretty soon, that each of us will experience that physical death, unless we're spared through the rapture, resurrection. So physical death has not stopped. But it's the spiritual death that I think this is talking about here. Uh, so it says, uh, still everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. Now Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come. How is he um, a symbol or a representation of Christ? Well, he's a representation of Christ as in the ante. So, whereas the first Adam yeah. fell and died spiritually, the second Adam, you know, never fell, was perfect, and can never die spiritually. So, it is an ante uh, type, if that makes sense. That, that, they're both assimilated as Adam, but opposing poles in that sense. One, one, one sin and died, one was perfect and lived forever. Yeah, it's it's uh, you you call it the anti. You got a thesis and an antithesis, the opposite. Uh, you've got a photograph and you got a photographic negative, and that's what this is: the first Adam, the last Adam. Uh, in verse 18, it says, "Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone." So, in in that, that's the the uh, opposite, they're, they're polar opposites, but uh, in that respect. One brought death into the world, the other brought life everlasting into the world. All right, we'll move on. Uh, uh, let's go first, 15.22. For so all be made alive. So Romans and then the same point is made again in First Corinthians fifteen forty five, and so it is written: the first man Adam was made a living soul; the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. I love that term, quickening spirit. Bill, I bet you like that. It sounds like it's right out of like uh, some kind of uh, English show, uh, like a Shakespearean play. <laughs> yeah, I, that is, do you know what? That was even in, the, in, a, in a sermon today that I heard. The word is a wonderful word, quickening, to be made alive, to be made quick. You know, that, I do like that one. It's very Shakespearean, very English, very old English. You, you, made, a, you made a video today about this? No, no, I was watching the video. I can't even remember what video it was, but it mentioned, you know, oh. quickening and explained being made alive, and, and that's a word that, you know, I even use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I love I love the, the whole idea of a quickening spirit. Uh, 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 that's what I was talking about earlier when I was going on about the... Uh, about the new birth 
Um, so here we, we, we have this term, the first atom and the last atom, and this comparison, but they're really com compared like polar opposites. It's like a, a magnet. You have a positive and a negative aspect to it. Uh, and, and it's like and, and, and with God you have good and with Satan you have evil well with Adam you have death with Christ you have life everlasting um, all right let's let's go now to um, uh, first Timothy 2 11 uh, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness and sobriety. Uh, I also have that listed in, in the... Uh, NLT I'll read um, uh, nevertheless the sentence put up upon woman of pain and motherhood does not hinder their soul salvation and they shall be saved eternally if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control uh, saved indeed through the childbearing or by the birth of the of the divine child I just want to just want to quickly say, before everyone comments on this one, that is one verse I still can't get in my head because it doesn't to me even now it still doesn't make sense because it it I know I'm wrong and there's obviously a deeper meaning to it, but it seems to on face value imply unless a woman has get you know has gives childbirth or stays sinless perfect you know she's not going to heaven, which would be contrary to you know the, the whole gospel of New Testament. So to me, it's a mystery. Or you know, if you if you can if you've grasped that one, Luke, and you know the answer, and I'd love to hear. Yeah. It, it uh, especially when I read it in the amplified. Uh, it seems like they they saved is through the power by of the KJV. Uh, uh, if they shall be saved in childbearing, um, well, that's that's not the part that I was really thinking about in this whole thing. I was thinking about the idea of of the woman being. Uh, in a subordinate position because of what it says here that if she's being blamed uh, uh, Adam was not deceived but the woman being deceived um, so that's the part that I was thought was interesting about this but if we look at verse 15 it, it is uh, troubling I uh, there's a lot of things that uh, verses that that's why I wanted to look at it in a different translation because sometimes that that's helpful but notwithstanding she shall be saved in childbearing um, well uh, Bill are you are you saying then uh, as it says here in the Amplified that it, it seems like she's ch she saved because she gives birth that's what I'm saying. At face value, that's what it seems to say. We know it's not saying that, and that's why perhaps even you know maybe Joanne might help us out because she knows the Greek. But reading that from, from just about every translation, it, it seems to imply that. But we know that's not the case because that would be counter to what the gospel says and about a thousand other passages. So there must be a, a deeper meaning, you know, in regard to this childbirth. There must be. <clears throat> uh -huh. Let me look at it in another translation here. Uh, 15. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Will be saved through childbearing. Well, I don't see how that could be referring to salvation. I think that's saved from, from death, maybe. In other words, maybe from the childbirth actually causing death. Because, you know, when we... When we see the word saved, a lot of times people think saved means physical harm. Um, and in this case, the physical harm may be the, the, the suffering of childbirth. In other words, the, child, the pain of childbirth will not reach the point that it kills her. That seems, that seems like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's one of, uh, that's just one of, I'm sure, many verses that we'll encounter, I've encountered over the years, and that uh, we'll continue to encounter that uh, uh, and maybe someone can come up with some good answer. Bill, I watched uh, several videos on uh, the Paul's thorn in the side recently, too, getting uh, different viewpoints on that. And uh, uh, so when you have a trouble verse, sometimes it may trouble you for, for years, and then you stumble across somebody who's, who's teaching it, and, you, and your eyes are opened, and you finally see the truth about it. So hopefully in this verse, the only thing I can say is that I don't think, I certainly couldn't be talking about salvation, because we know a person is not saved by giving birth to a child. Uh, exactly. So therefore, exactly. we're going to rule We've got to rule out, you know, uh, salvation and eternal life. Uh, I, I think it has to be just saved from the pain is so bad, it, you know, you think it was going to kill you, but it's not going to kill you. You'll, you'll survive it. Um, all right. Let me see. Okay, that's the, uh, that's everything there is on Adam and Eve. Uh, now, I know we didn't get through our, our normal two-hour period here, but uh, I guess we can just uh, uh, kind of take this time to sum up anything that we've uh, that discussed up to this point. Uh, I don't need to. We don't need to beat a dead horse. I think we discussed Adam and Eve quite thoroughly over. Let me see. Three sessions is six hours. So over seven hours and 20 minutes, we've been discussing Adam and Eve. That's quite a thorough study on these two people. Uh, apparently, there's no other verses that re reference them in the scriptures. So is there anything else that, that needs to be said about Adam and Eve? No, I can't, I can't think of anything. I think... Yeah, I think we've covered just about everything. Never get unless anyone else has got some kind of. Oh, I must not think that's it. That's right. Joanne's just posted something in the in the side, so I'm just gonna have a quick read of that. You're, you're muted there, I'm afraid, Luke. You're going to have to read that all again now. <laughs> yeah. I think Joanne's point about here, about uh, shall be saved in childbearing or with childbearing by the Messiah who is born of a woman. So in other words, women giving birth to a child uh, provides salvation uh, because through, through Eve, I mean through uh, Mary, Jesus was born. So through that that particular childbirth, salvation was provided. That's the that's the point that was made in the NLT translation. 
So uh, Joanne's point agrees with that. Uh, but that brings, she reminded me that the, the original part of that, those verses that I wanted to discuss, uh, we forgot about here. Let's go back to that. And that is, uh, it says, let the woman learn in silence and all subjection. Now this is 1 Timothy. Uh, let, let's first ask, uh, who, wrote, who wrote 1 Timothy? Uh, and what's the purpose of writing 1 Timothy? Well, the apostle Paul wrote First Timothy, and Timothy was like a like a son to to Paul, and he he was actually a young man, very young man, and at he at his own congregation. So Paul really taught Timothy a lot. You know, he was like his little what's the word? Almost like a little disciple in that sense. You know, Paul, Paul took him under his wing and taught him. You know, just about everything. Yeah, uh, Timothy and, and uh, Titus, I think it's Titus, uh, they're, they're referred to as the pastoral epistles. And uh, Paul uh, was, I think he served primarily as an evangelist. He did not really stay at a church and, you know, be the, like the pastor of a church. He, he was always on the move uh, and establishing another church, planning and building churches, and then going back and having to correct the churches when they got into, you know, apostasy. But uh, so he'd leave people at each church as a pastor, and he wrote letters to Timothy and to Titus to teach them about how to do this job of being a pastor. Uh, and in this case, he's addressing the question about women, how women should be conducting themselves in the church. There's another one, I think, in Corinthians, where he takes this on too, telling women to not talk, because in that particular congregation, the women were out of control. Uh, I don't think we should take that, I think in, in the Corinthian church, I don't think we should ex uh, apply that across the board to all congregations. I think that was a letter specifically to that church, to that group of women, who were speaking in tongues and everything was out of control and he had to teach them you've got to have them, have them stop talking it's disruptive and and that's not the way you should be conducting your uh, your congregation uh, in this case he's talking to Timothy and the same kind of thing is brought up again about uh, women uh, Let women let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Now that seems pretty pretty strict and harsh, doesn't it? Well, I think I think you're probably right in, in regard to the, it, it, it could have been another scenario where it was getting silly and out of control in in Corinth, and obviously. Corinth was before, obviously, he, he wrote his epistles to Timothy because that was the last epistles he wrote, was the, Tim yeah, the ones to Timothy. So I, I suppose he was almost covering his back in as much as saying, look, you know, we don't want another reoccurrence of what happened in Corinth, so I'm going to give you some advice here. You know, so if you get women in and they're, and they're, they're chatting and, and they're, they're, they're behaving insubordinate or whatever, you know, you need to deal with that quite quite firmly and quite abruptly, perhaps, but, you know, I can't see, you know, I can't see it being as a general rule that, that women need to shut up and just sit in a corner, you know, because that, that, that would go against, you know, God's grace and mercy in, in that situation anyway, so it has to be a, you know, specifically to Timothy for a specific reason. That, that, that there's not a reoccurrence of, of misbehaviour and disorder within the, the, the new fellowship that Timothy is starting up. Hmm. Um, well, there's just two points that I... Sorry, have I interrupted someone? Have I interrupted someone? No, no, carry on. 
Oh, sorry. I just didn't want to cut anyone out here. Um, look, just uh, two points. Firstly, I agree um, with you, Brother Bill, um, in saying that. Um, secondly, I think um, last week I brought up the fact of how how uh, the root of a woman's brain thinks, um, being from the emotional side of things, um, because that's where how we've been created. Not saying that we don't we can't think logically, but we do think emotionally, um, and that's us primarily. Um, and our passion can overtake our logic in a lot of things. And if we if you have I don't know. You probably have, and I don't want to stereotype women, but I've seen it personally a lot. And um, you, if you get a bunch of women together, um, you know, and they're all talking at once and they're passionate about something, nothing ever gets heard, and nothing ever gets taken in, and it's really not edifying to God in any way. And I think what Paul was doing was just saying, listen, I don't think he was saying don't actually, you know, don't have a say, but but do it respectfully. Do it in in a way that you're edifying God instead of, you know, like a bunch of gabbling women, you know. Um, that's my take. Um, and I... And I I personally don't agree, um, and women all over the world will probably hate me saying this maybe, um, I personally don't agree with women being um, in the position of preachers or ministers. Um, I do believe women should be... Uh, should be in the role of teaching, um, should be in the role of sharing uh, the gospel wherever possible. Um, and I think also that women should be encouraging and supportive to, you know, to, to men um, who, of course, Christian men who are in the faith, godly men. And be assisting them as much as possible and not being a stumbling block by, you know, getting together and all talking at once and all getting emotional and passionate about something and off on dif different tangents. And I'm going to get killed over this, but that's my belief. Mm -hmm. Okay, sister, thank you. Um, this is a kind of controversial subject, and you know we've taken it on in previous uh, studies of Adam and Eve. The first one is said that he was made as a helpmate, and then another there was another reference that we had to discuss the same subject, and so we've already gone over the idea of a woman and a man's relationship and the, the, the best, the role of each in the scriptures. Uh, so starting in early in Genesis and all the way through the scriptures, we see that there is a picture of an ideal. Uh, now, that brings me to the question of, uh, uh, we, we know, we, we believers, we know that God exists and God knows what's best. I mean, God knows what's better better for me than I know for myself. Um, I might have an idea of what I think is uh, would could be good for me, but God really knows, and I, I'm just guessing. But if I can, if I can live according to the way God says, hey, Luke, this is the best way for you to conduct yourself, for you to live your life, and if I listen to Him, I'm going to be better off. This is, you talk about getting in trouble, Joanne. I might get in trouble here, but I'm going to say now that uh, I don't think God gave us uh, any kind of commands. He gave, you know, first of all, all the Ten Commandments and all the 613 laws, they were never given to me. I'm not a Jew. I never have been a Jew. They're never given to any of us. They were given to Israel. 
they give them to the, the Jewish people. Uh, those laws never applied to Gentiles. They weren't applied in the past, and they should not apply to us today. But but even if I was a Jew and looking at the commandments, uh, and uh, uh, it, it says that don't commit adultery. Now, I have to ask, is God saying to me, don't commit adultery because he doesn't want me to have fun? I mean, it would be a lot more fun if I could go out and have a bunch of girlfriends on the side and not be just only with my wife. That would be a lot more fun, I think, but, but, but God says don't do that. Now, is he saying don't do it because he doesn't want me to have fun, doesn't want me to enjoy this uh, promiscuous uh, sexual life? I don't think so. I don't think he's he's telling us do this and don't do that because he wants to like um, uh, be put us under a sort of like bondage, of, you know, take away our freedom. He's saying I know what's best for you. If you commit adultery, it's going to ruin your life and your marriage and so and your children's lives. So I'm saying don't do it. So I think that. Um, when we're told not to fornicate and not to commit adultery and things like that, it's not because God doesn't want us to enjoy sex. It's it's because He knows that if we don't do it within the the, the boundaries of marriage, that that negative things will come result from it. He wants us to be spared from it. So we're told these commandments for our own good, not because He wants to put His thumb on us and restrict us from in, enjoying ourselves. And I think this is the same thing with this question about men and women. He's saying, this is the ideal. The man, uh, I made man and I made the woman and their partners, and the woman should be helping the man. The man has certain attributes, the woman has certain attributes. The work is a team, but they're different. They're not interchangeable parts. And, and this is the way, so he teaches us the ideal. Now we can go along with his ideal and, and uh, have the woman subject to the husband, and it says here, you know, uh, these verses we're discussing now is another example of the same thing. We can go along with that, uh, or we can resist it and, and say, well, I think I got a better way, uh, but it, it's not because God is, uh, is trying to give us a rigid set of rules. He's saying, I know the best system for you to live your lives. Now, does, does anybody... You know, I think that that's crazy. Well, in general, I'd like to kind of share, I'm sure, I don't know um, how far you guys have actually talked about, but regarding First Timothy uh, 2, I think that the, um, where he says, uh, the women learn in silence with all subjection, I think that kind of means to, and it points to, when uh, Eve kind of got confused, uh, I'm sure Adam taught her exactly, you know, what God taught him, and he he shared the, you know, basically what not to do and what to do, and and apparently Eve got it wrong uh, because of her whatever. So I think that's what the verse means, um, you know, kind of keep your patience and learn in silence, and in verse. 12, where it says, um, I suffer not a woman to teach. I think that means it's not a must nor a command. It's like asking, you know. Um, uh, you know, he's, uh, Paul is basically asking, if, if it is okay with you guys, women, uh, don't teach <laughs> and have uh, you surf over men and, and be silent. And we, I think we were talking about how that sort of thing should be done in the churches. And of course at home, I mean, you know, I, I would prefer uh, my wife uh, uh, helping me because after all, you know, God created women as, as a helpmate. And uh, I think in certain aspect, aspect, women should be a little bit better than men in certain area so that she can be actually the helpmate helpmate I mean if you want to help somebody you gotta know what you know what the heck you don't doing and that person probably 
doesn't know what he's doing. So if you are helping someone, that means you are at least able to uh, you are able to help that person. So uh, in that sense, I think that you know women's uh, authority and job uh, revolves around her house and her family member and, and loving her husband. Mm -hmm. And I mean, re uh, reverencing her husband, and and also, as Christ said, husband uh, loving uh, uh, the the wives. But um, I think that's what basically uh, what uh, what the scripture is saying. You know, just uh, try to be quiet, keep your silence uh, in, at, in the in the churches, um, and not to have some sort of authority over any sort of man. Uh, in the churches, and this is why one of the reasons why I don't really believe in women um, pastors or, or, or things like that. You know. Yeah, that that gets us to an, another good question, Sam. You, you opened up another can of worms. Uh, there are, I think th these scriptures are, are telling us that uh, look, if you if you're married. Let your let your husband be the pastor and the teacher, and you support him. Uh, if you're married, uh, the wife shouldn't be the pastor, and the husband, you know, be the the one that's learning and she's teaching the husband. That's that's not the way God desires it. That's not the ideal. Uh, but if you're not married, I don't see any any indication why a, a woman uh, should, since she doesn't have a husband to uh, help. And she's not usurping her husband's authority. If she's not married, uh, I don't see any reason why she can't be a teacher or even a pastor. Uh, I've changed my views on that over the years about women pastors. Uh, uh, there's examples in the scriptures of some great women in the New Testament. I don't recall their names off the top of my head, but that were... Uh, uh, you know, almost every time they refer to a church, they refer to the churches. And, and uh, uh, so I think there's examples of women who have done the job better than men, maybe in place of men, because the men weren't doing it. But if I think if you have a marriage and they're, they're Christians and they're doing a ministry, the man needs to be the head and the woman needs to be the support, is what the point is here. Yeah, and I understand, but the verse... 12 uh, clearly it says um, a woman it doesn't say a wife and it does it does say over the man it doesn't say over the husband so you know we know that uh, we are you know Paul is uh, specifically talking about women in general um, teaching or usurping authority over the man now the, it, that depends where you are even at home I don't think that's the wife's place to to do so my wife's place is to help her husband and reverence her husband uh, and women in the churches the physical churches I'm talking about uh, I don't think that they ought to teach or usurp over uh, over the man uh, as I said uh, I agree with Paul and Paul is actually asking I suffer not a woman to teach so that doesn't mean that you shouldn't, but you know he's basically asking honestly not to. I think a lot of it is to do with continuity and just things just running smoothly. It isn't like a lot, a lot of you know churches, denominations, and even Christians would 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 turn this into a, a war of the sexes when, when it really isn't. It's literally a. a a matter of continuity, I think. You know that that, that there has been set a certain order that works, and and is wholesome and right. And, and I think Paul, you know, tells Timothy, you know, this 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 continuity needs to continue. You know, there's some kind of order, you know, within the I suppose the, the, the physical church. Although we are the church in as much, but when 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 people gather together, you know, that there needed to be a little bit of the order. Because we see what happened in Corinth, there was utter disorder and utter chaos. So I don't think I agree with Luke that it isn't a, a rigid rule. You know, it's not a set in stone command. 
you know, is literally, come on, let's just try and keep peace among the brethren. I'm paraphrasing this. Let's just have a continuity. Just, just keep it. You know, the 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 the, the men you need to be in charge. You need to, you know, take the lead in wrong in this, and they need, you know, just to, you know, let things go along. You know, <laughs> in a, in a right and decent manner. You know, so it isn't a battle of the sexes, which some you know people portray it is. It is literally for for order and to keep things running smoothly and and in peace. Because we know that you know women have roles. We even know that Phoebe, she she was a deaconess, what we call you know a diaconate nowadays. So she had roles within the church, you know, doing quite quite a lot of things. You know, so it isn't a, it isn't a ruling out of women from from the congregation, but. You know, as I personally, this is me personally. You know, the the the, the, the overall headship within a within a church, you know, should be a man, unless there's not a man man enough to be a head of the church. You know, this this is what I feel. You know, these are, but it isn't as it isn't as we say. We must really emphasise to people who are watching this hangout because there there there's going to be people who, who are secular and don't understand. You know what we're talking about. You know, these things are not set in stone. You know, Christianity is not saying that women are lesser and should have no authority. What we're saying is, for, for, for the reason of continuity, order, and, and all that is good and wholesome, it is good that, that a man should lead the church and, and then everyone fit into their roles, whether they be an evangelist, whether they be a deacon, whether they be anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are all good points, uh, and, and it's hard to argue against Sam saying that it doesn't say husband and wife, it says uh, woman usurping the authority over a man. So uh, um, I, I know that in my own experience, uh, matter of fact, just today, be, before this hangout, I, I was watching several videos of a young woman on YouTube who was doing a great job of teaching. Uh, now, uh, she was teaching, and according to this, I mean, I know someone else that uh, was, uh, I thought, an excellent teacher. Uh, you may know her name. She goes by Brain Audi. She's not on YouTube anymore. She's on uh, Vimeo, I think, but Brain Audi and I have known her for a long time. She corrected me immediately once when I told her she was doing a great job teaching. She said, oh, I'm not a teacher. Because she didn't want to, you know, violate this premise that women are not should not be teachers. But in fact, she was teaching. I mean, you can call it something else. You can give yourself a different label, like I'm a commentator, or I'm a, or I'm just saying what I think. But no, it was definitely teaching. And the woman today that I was watching, I thought she did an excellent job of teaching. And I've I've run across many women on YouTube over the last eight years that I thought were doing a really good job of teaching the scriptures. And I, I, I would I hate the idea of them having to keep their mouths shut and not being able to teach. But uh, in, that, in this case, uh, I don't know of them uh, being, uh, uh, you know, usurping some authority over a man. I will say this, one final thought, and then I'll leave this open for you guys and then we'll finish the show here. Uh, many years ago, I read a book it was not theological, but I thought it was interesting about marriage. And the title was Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And it was uh, really uh, summed up how to conduct your marriage. And it's really, really very simple premise. And the advice was this. Husbands, the wives want to talk, and they go on to vent. They want to be able to tell you about their girlfriend and the fight and, and this and the problem with the guy at the boss at work and stuff. And the man, within 30 seconds, listens to the wife and uh, figures out, through reason, figures out a proper solution. And he wants to immediately give his wife the solution to the problem. But the wife is not talking to the husband because she's seeking a solution. She's talking because she needs to speak. She needs to vent and get it out. So the man has to learn to not give a solution, but keep his mouth shut and just let his wife vent for an hour or two or three or however long it takes for her to get it all out. And if the man does that, the wife will be very happy. 
And their advice to the, to the woman was, your husband needs his ego massaged constantly. Never criticize your husband. Instead, always praise him. Tell him he's wonderful and great. I have every opportunity. That will feed his ego, and then he's going to love you and treat you right. So that was the basic summary of that book. And actually, I think that kind of advice actually would be very effective and help, very helpful in life. But I think that perhaps this is an example. If, if a, a wife is usurping authority over a husband as a teacher in a church, um, and that the man's ego is, uh, is not going to deal with that very well. Uh, you know, as we discussed in earlier studies, our, our anatomy is different, our brains are different, our chemicals and our hormones are different, and, and uh, you know, we're supposed to be different so that we can come together as a team and accomplish more through, like, like it talks about the body of Christ and having different members and different functions. The same thing in a marriage. A man and a woman are supposed to have, bring different things to the table. Uh, otherwise, you might as well be homosexuals getting married, and then you can bring the same thing to the table. And, uh, but uh, with a man and a woman being married, they bring these, all these different things to, to, into the marriage, and, and they should complement each other and be better as, as, as a unit because of all that. But if the woman is taking the role of the man and being the head, and the man is feeling being littled, and his ego is harmed, everything will fall apart. So maybe that's the root of all of this advice. Okay, we're going to go for final comments on the study, uh, and then we'll have our final invitation here. Uh, let's start with uh, Brother Bill first. Yep, 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 yep. Final comments so on the study, I think it's been good. We've, we've covered a lot of area, a lot of ground, and I think, you know, Predominantly, we, we are mostly in agreement with each other. You know, throughout, you know, thankfully, this is unusual, you know, within <laughs> Christendom, unfortunately. But I do believe we are of one mind and one accord. We, we might have slightly different variations on what, what we've learned and what we've studied over the, the, these last four weeks. But I think we are, you know, mostly in one mind. You know, and, and I, I can only hope and pray that, that, that people that come across this, this, you know, this little section that they'll that be able to glean something from us and understand that, you know, as, as Christians, you know, we're not all, you know, <laughs> we're misogynist bigots, but we are actually reasonable people. We, we, we see what God is clearly saying, and, and whatever God is saying, it is always, you know, full of grace, it is full of love, it is full of mercy, and, and, and God desires you know, an equality between man and woman. We're different, we have different roles, but we're equally different. You know, that, that, that's what I'd surmise. Hmm. I like that term. I don't think I've ever heard it before, maybe. Equally different. That's a beautiful concept. Okay, uh, Brother Dean. Uh, you, you've asked us a lot of hard questions in the study of Adam and Eve. We've tried our best to answer them. I don't, I don't know if you're really satisfied with our answers, but go ahead. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Look, um, yeah, I mean, it was a good study. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, a lot of questions answered. And, yeah, I hope it's a blessing to anyone else who's watching as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Dean. And Again, I, we do appreciate you, your your you're daring to answer questions. There's sometimes people have a lot of questions in the back of their mind, and they they don't ever bring them out. And and uh, maybe they're I don't know it's embarrassment or, or whatever for whatever reason, or maybe they they don't want to bring up a, some controversy. And but I think it's good. I I'm I'm not afraid to hear any question. And I, I think everybody on the panel here probably feels the same way that uh, you can ask me about any theological question. I don't mind discussing it because. Uh, even if you we don't end up agreeing, I know we will still have peace uh, between us, and, and uh, we, even though there's not a, an agreement on the answer. Uh, okay, S Sister Joanne, your your comments on the study of Adam and Eve. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, I just um actually fell off the chair and lost everything, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, just bear with me for one second. Yeah, um, 
Look, um, my conclusion to all this is um, that we're all connected um, with the first Adam, uh, you know, the, the natural and legal head of the human race. Um, you know, as uh, depraved and guilty sinners, um, and so are included. You know, we're included in the sentence of death, which God pronounced on him. Um, however, uh, all who are connected with the last Adam, Jesus, uh, through repentance, faith in His redeeming work, are forgiven, and um, you know, we receive the free gift. Um, of salvation, you know, uh, through Christ, um, and so uh, you know, have passed from death to life, and we see that in Colossians uh, one fourteen, you know, um, Romans five seventeen, and one John three fourteen, um, and um, yeah, I, I guess. Um, at the end of it is that you know we've uh, we've got God to praise and thank for for loving us so much you know that he gave us his only son and I just think in that if you think as a parent having to give your only child up um, it's an immense thing it's I couldn't have done it. I couldn't give up my first. I couldn't give up any of mine. But yet God did for us to save us. Um, and I, I just think that's something to really reflect on, you know, and the price that Jesus paid on that cross for us, for all of us, for you know, not just for me, but for all of us that come to him and accept and believe in him. So, yeah, I guess that's what I want to say. All right. Thank you, Sister. I appreciate you participating and all the con contributing to this discussion. And Brother Sam, what are you, your conclusions on Adam and Eve? Well, I think we talked about pretty much, you know, a lot of things basically cover a whole bunch of things that, you know, we need to probably discuss more in detail. But I think uh, what Brother Bill was talking about, you know, equally different. And I would expound on that and, and say equally blessed, just like, you know, how the unjust and the just are equally blessed and equally loved, you know. Uh, Beside uh, being women and uh, men, besides uh, Eve and Adam, or Adam and Eve, we both have our duties and callings. So I think it's best not to step on our toes, each other, too much. You know, I think that's what it means by, uh, you know, First Timothy second, uh, and I think it means also less know how how it's done properly you know epistles from uh, Paul uh, to the church are mostly written in in, in regards to uh, how certain things would be done properly in Christ in the body of Christ and and the churches um, so like for example certain behavior you know it would point out how it should be done uh, same thing with uh, with the teaching. Uh, uh, you know, it, it, teaching is just fine, but it's, it's it's about where it's done by whom. You know, uh, so I think it would be proper for us to follow uh, that sort of you know direction, but it's not a must, but it is recommended to follow certain. You know, certain things so that certain proper things can be done, uh, whether that's between men and women, whether that's between among saints. You know, I think these are recommendations that we need to uh, kind of abide in a way.
but that doesn't mean that you will lose your salvation because you, you wouldn't. You know, that doesn't mean that just because you, let's say you are a women pastor, that doesn't mean that you are not saved, you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, I think uh, above and beyond any sort of gender differences, I think since we are equally different, equally blessed, equally loved, uh, let's respect our each other, uh, let's try to do certain things properly, uh, not to step on our toes too much, and, and, and so on, uh, and focus on edifying each other. And that's what I take out of uh, Adam and Eve uh, all the way to uh, First Timothy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brother Sam. Uh, I, I hope um, if, if you're watching this episode and haven't seen the previous episodes, you go back and watch it from the beginning. Um, I found it very interesting. I'm looking forward to all the future studies we're going to be doing and all these uh, very significant uh, characters that we find in the scriptures. Uh, one thing that stands out to me right now about this study is that no one has uh, questioned the historical accuracy of this account. Uh, this current pope has called this creation account and the account of Adam and Eve as a fable. But uh, none of us consider it to be a fable or an allegory. We consider it to be history. So uh, I'm happy that everybody on the panel agrees that this is an actual historical event that's recorded of the God creating the first man and the first woman and how we came into existence. We did not evolve piece by piece by piece until we finally came up with this product we have today of a human being. God created us as a finished product, as a human being. And the first one was Adam and then Eve. And because of the fall, because of their not believe in God, and instead they chose to believe Satan. They ate from that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, have that knowledge and be like God, and they, uh, they fell. Sin entered the world, and death entered the world. And all of us who are descendants of Adam and Eve have inherited sin and death. It's in our genes. It's a birth defect. And if you're watching now, and you haven't been treated for this disorder, then... Uh, yeah, we want you to know there is a there is a treatment. There is something you can do to be healed from this uh, the fall of man. I just had something pop up. Is this a change? Can anybody still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So we have this inherited this defect from Adam and Eve, and we're all going to die. We're all going to be found guilty at the judgment, we, we all will suffer the second death in the, the lake of fire unless something is done about it. But God loved the world so much that he provided a solution, a, a cure to this malady. I would ask another Bill, could you tell the viewing audience what, what is the cure to this malady that man has inherited? Well, the cure, the cure is in simple terms, Jesus Christ is the cure. And I would go further. I'm just going to put my, my camera on because when I like to give a gospel message, I like people to actually see that I am a real human being and I do exist. But I do feel compelled this evening to, to read something that might seem a bit off or, 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 or not you know, applicable, but it really is spiritually. I just wanted to read Deuteronomy 30, 19. All right, and in there it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. That I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Now, I'd like to say today that, that that this this blessing that you can choose is Jesus Christ, and this life that you can choose this day is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ even says that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
So today, you know, people can freely choose out of their own free will this Jesus Christ who loves you dearly. And he is offering you today blessing and not cursing. He is offering you life eternal and not life uneternal or damnation. So, you know, to, to, to believe in this Christ is, is simple. You just need to, to know in your heart that, that, that you are you are a mortal. You're a fallen human being. You know, you are, you are a, you know, a descendant from Adam who fell through transgression. All right? and, this, and this is called sin. We miss the mark. So to recognize that we are sinners and that we cannot save ourselves, but also recognize there is one who is Jesus Christ, Son of God, who can save us and has already made payment for our salvation 2,000 years ago at Calvary. So if we used to believe this day, recognizing that you can't save yourself, that, that Jesus Christ loves you this much and died for all your sins, past, present, and future, according to the scriptures, that he was buried for you, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, proven that he had power over death and of life. If we were to believe on this Jesus Christ, and then facts, we will be saved this very moment, and you will be amongst those who are not cursed, amongst those who are blessed, and amongst those who have chosen life this day. So I plead with you, Peter, if you're watching today, choose life, choose Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you, brother. Uh, thank uh, you to all the panelists and to everybody, the viewing audience. Uh, uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed this discussion on Adam and Eve. And if you have never put your faith in Jesus, I hope you understand what Brother Bill just told you, that we're, we're not asking you to join a religion or become a religious person or follow a set of religious rules. We're asking you to trust a person, Jesus Christ, God, who became a man, who died for all our sins, who raised himself from the dead, showing you he does have the power of life and death. Put your faith in him. Don't put your faith in your own ability to satisfy God the way that Cain did through the labors of his hands. Instead, put your faith in this blood sacrifice, that Jesus sacrificed his life so that you could have eternal life. Put your faith completely in him. And on that day, at that very moment, the very instant you put your faith in Jesus completely, you become a child of God. And once you're a child of God, you're always a child of God. Thank you for watching. All right. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.